that really we should have uh, again in order to deal with what, what we might consider uh, as maybe solutions. That's of course if we agree that these are ethical issues that are unique um, uh, to, to immigration and asylum practice. Uh, thank you. to introduce Pablo Rojas Capari of the Migrants' Rights Centre of Ireland. And uh, Pablo will speak in particular uh, about the implications for immigration and asylum reform campaigns as a result of the decision in Hussein versus the Labour Court in Yunus. Hi. Um, I guess that when I was asked to come and present to you, I thought that there's no point in me discussing the, the law in itself, because you're probably a lot more knowledge about that, our ethics in that respect. So I thought I would just introduce how we as a non-governmental organization use the law to advance social change for immigrants in Ireland. Um, the Migrant Rights Centre has been... Uh, it's a community work organization campaigning for social justice for migrants who experience exclusion and vulnerability. As such, we work mainly with non-EU migrants and those who are particularly at risk of poverty. Uh, we have been operating for the past uh, 13 years and we are a solid R Civil Rose Award organization for our work at European social justice. So we work nationally and internationally. Uh, what makes us different from other organizations is that we work through the community work methodology, which actually will um, give you an idea about how, what our, where our ethics come from. So we are concerned about the empowerment of the people we work with, and we are um, concerned about collective outcomes rather than individual outcomes, which in a way can seem a bit contradictory to the work of legal practitioners in the sense that we do not see like we use individual education, but our aim is to achieve collective outcomes, not individual outcomes. Uh, in terms of law, we work in four specific areas. We work in employment law, so in, in order to achieve workplace rights. We work in, a, in the area of immigration law, particularly as it uh, affects irregular migrants, so people without legal status. We work in criminal law by um, working in the area of trafficking for forced labor. In fact, we are uh, the only experts on identification of forced labor recognized by the Criminal Legal Aid Scheme. And finally, we work uh, on leadership development, which is basically how to promote uh, activism and uh, how to create leaders in, within migrant communities. Uh, again, as I said, uh, our ethics come from, the, from our community work methodology, which is concerned about redistribution of power in society and we try to uh, facilitate migrants to take roles of leadership and, and where they can affect and inform decisions that concern their lives, including law change. Um, we, I say, we, we see the law as an instrument to affect social change, and that's what we're concerned with. You know, we, we identify gaps in the current legislation, including our immigration and employment legislation, uh, and how that affects immigrants. And we try to achieve, achieve legal change in order to create collective outcomes. To do that, as I said, we have four strategies. One is individual litigation. Uh, then there is campaign work, uh, awareness raising, and alliance building. Now, I suggested that I was going to discuss the Hussein uh, versus the Labour Court and Unis as that is as a perfect example of how we work and how we use the law to, to the benefit of a, a wider group of people. Now, just to give you a brief outline of the case, because you may not be familiar with it, and the case relates to uh, a Pakistani man called Mohammed Yunis, who was trafficked to Ireland uh, in 2003. And his trafficker rendered him undocumented by uh, letting his work permit expire. Um, he, ex he was exploited for his labor for about seven years, uh, working roughly around 96 hours a week for, uh, on average, 72 cents an hour. Um, MRCI came in contact with Mohammed Yunis in 2009. We assisted him in exiting the situation. Uh, we uh, well, prepared, identified him as a victim of trafficking and report 
to the, the Guard of National Immigration Bureau using the Delphi indicators, so basically using the criminal law, and uh, applied for him to be recognized as a victim of trafficking. Uh, on the same time, we, we lodged complaints to the Labour Court um, for breaches of employment law. Uh, those particular complaints were vindicated by the Labour Relations Commission, then by the Labour Court on, a, on their appeal from the employer, and Eunice was awarded 92,000 euros in compensation, uh, and that went to the Circuit Court for enforcement, and the Circuit Court validated those complaints. Uh, the employer nonetheless decided that uh, the Labour Court had no jurisdiction to deal with that matter because Mohammed Yunus was undocumented at the time. Uh, and as such, uh, they are, his, his legal team argued that uh, the Labour Court, like employ, contractual law does not apply when a person is undocumented because, uh, because of um, the legality of contract. Um, that went to the High Court um, and Justice Hogan basically uh, said that the employer was right, that the Labour Court had no jurisdiction on the matter, while at the same time referring the matter to the, the Parliament of the Dole in order to, for, for the legal gap to be looked at. Uh, the, the, where the case stands at the moment, it's that it has been appealed to uh, the Supreme Court, it has been given priority hearing, and it, ho we hope it will be heard by the end of the term. Um, so that's in the area of employment law. In terms of, the of his immigration status, Ms. Uh, Mohammed Yunus' case was, um, was uh, turned down as a, as, a, as a case of trafficking for forced labor in Ireland because there was no physical evidence of force. Uh, as such, then he was turned down. Me, Mohammed Yunus was undocumented at the time, so we, what, and he was served with a Section 3 letter in intention to deport. Uh, we made application for humanitarian leave to remain on his behalf and, and he was granted humanitarian leave to remain under Section 3 of the Immigration Act. So his legal status was then rectified. Uh, so we identified two, from that case two main gaps in the law. One is in, in terms of accessing the labour court and accessing compensation for labour exploitation. The, the doors were closed now for undocumented migrants. So on one side, we continue um, by, well, we built alliance with a legal team and we continue to push the case forward. Now it's going to the, uh, to the, to the Supreme Court and if that doesn't uh, address the issue, then we're going to go to the European Court of Human Rights. That's one strategy and that will have an effect on, to, for Mohammed and other people who were there before. Uh, okay, five minutes. Now, the other thing is that, in the meantime, that created a legal limbo where people cannot access the labor court if they're exploited but undocumented. And that sends a negative image to employers saying, like, if you employ an undocumented migrant, you can do whatever you want with them. So, um, we campaigned for the law to be changed, and, that, and um, as it is now, there's been, an in, it's been introduced an amendment to the Employment Permit Bill, which will allow access to undocumented migrants to civil courts, not to the labor court, but for them to, to seek compensation or for exploitation. So that's a, like, that's a direct success from the campaign work that we did on, uh, Mohammed, on the Mohammed Yunus case. So in terms of the trafficking legislation, now the, there, was, there was a lack of clarity from our criminal law in terms of what forced labor uh, uh, exactly meant. So using the Mohammed Yunus case, we campaigned for the introduction of uh, the ILO definition of forced labor in our criminal law. Uh, and, and that was introduced in 2013, and now the definition of uh, forced labor is, uh, is in, has been inserted in our human trafficking legislation by using the ILO definition. And finally, Mohammed Yunus was also uh, you know, a work permit holder who was made undocumented by, uh, by exploitation of his employer. So, We've been, we had a campaign called the Bridging Visa campaign that's been going on for years and that uh, then turned to the, uh, to the undocumented worker scheme. Um, we wanted that legislated for and in the new employment permit bill there's an introduction to, uh, to what's called a reactivation scheme which means that any person that migrated to Ireland on a work permit legally and can prove that they became undocumented through no, by, by the abuse or through no fault of his or her own 
can then apply to have a, his immigration status rectified. So now that's legislated for. So these are very, three significant changes for uh, a wide community of people that come from individual cases. But it, that's just a step, the next step further after individual litigation is when you can actually achieve uh, collective outcomes out of that. So the only way that we, we see that those changes are possible is by collectivizing the issue and by raising awareness of the issue by using all tools available, which is media uh, and, and public awareness, and by building strategic alliances with the legal profession, with the trade union movement, um, with migrant communities, and with uh, a variety of people. For example, in the Supreme Court, uh, Amnesty International, uh, the Secretariat in London has decided they will file an amicus curiae on, on the... Um, on, on the Supreme Court case, because the Mohammed Yunus case is considered of public, in, a pro, public worldwide interest. So uh, that's, for example, something that w it's achievable only when you build alliances. I guess that's it for me. Thank you to Samada, Ronald, Femi, and Pablo for their in insightful. Uh, discussions on uh, four different aspects uh, of ethics uh, in relation to immigration and asylum law as it is currently practiced. Um, it, it was refreshing from my point of view to hear all four because normally when we speak, as, as when the bar speaks about its social responsibilities, um, it, it normally does so on ceremonial occasions, like the opening of the, of the uh, legal year. And uh, in, in my view, um, th those responsibilities need to be central constituents of our daily practice. It should be something that we think about uh, uh, far more regularly than on um, we say the opening of the legal year. So from the point of view of, a, of a discussing open, okay, we've only literally, uh, uh, we say, taken away the cobwebs from an area that is rarely uh, discussed, uh, uh, certainly at, at, at bar level. I hope um, that uh, if we've been given food for thought uh, going on in, into the uh, future. Finally, I would like to leave you with a quote that I came across uh, that uh, is attributed to the, uh, the late uh, American judge, uh, Earl Warren, with regard to ethics. And uh, I just thought it was germane to what we've been uh, uh, hearing from all four speakers. And he stated that in civilized life, law floats in a sea of ethics. Each is indispensable to civilization. Without law, we should be at the mercy of the, of the least scrupulous. And without ethics, law could not exist. Bear that in mind. Thank you. Anyone who wishes to uh, have a drink, there are drinks uh, available, but you have to pay for them yourself. <laughs> In the sheds, anyone who wishes to join, but uh, other than that, you can go your own way. Thank you.